We live in a world scarred by a history of man-made horrors. A world where wars, dictatorships, and countless atrocities seem to prove the age-old claim. Humans are inherently evil. But does the science of human behavior really support this idea? Well, in this video, I'm going to share seven books I've discovered over my years of experience as an internationally published researcher in the behavioral sciences that will not only restore your faith in humanity, but which will also offer you practical methods for making a positive impact on the world around you. And the first book on this list is Humankind by Rutger Bregman. In 1971, the psychologist Philip Zimbardo conducted an experiment to test whether people left to their own devices would choose to knowingly call cause harm to others. Zimbardo assigned certain test subjects the role of prison inmate and assigned others the role of prison guard. And can you guess the results? Well, seemingly without any prompting, those assigned to be the guards abused their power, subjecting the prisoners to various mental and physical harm. For decades, many researchers went on to conclude that this was clear evidence of humans' innate tendency toward evil. And Zimbardo, although heavily criticized for his experiment, went on to write the influential book The Lucifer Effect, claiming that same cynical conclusion. But did this experiment really expose what Zimbardo claims? Well, in Humankind, Bregman points to the many flaws in what has now come to be known as the infamous Stanford Prison Experiment. He not only points to the fact that Zimbardo was later found to have secretly instructed the guards to act abusively, but he highlights many other prison experiment studies which have revealed the exact opposite effect, namely that not only do guards not end up abusing their power, but they often end up extensively collaborating with inmates and forming close relationships with them. But come on. We can't be that naive, right? If we just look at history as well as our world today, we can see clearly that people have committed countless atrocities and have mistreated and continue to mistreat each other. But not so fast, because the facts about our evolutionary past tell a different story. And a key piece of that story is told by the next book on our list, The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker. Imagine the ancient hunter-gatherer roaming the landscape looking for food. What kinds of traits would be the most likely to help them survive and reproduce? Well, whatever those traits are would hold the key to revealing our human nature. In this book, Pinker, who is known for his extensive work in evolutionary genetics, biological anthropology, linguistics, and other related fields, uses evolutionary science to argue against, among other ideas, a viewpoint known as romanticism, or in other words, the view that humans are naturally good. On first look, his argument seems pretty damning. Humans, he shows, are inherently prone to conflict and also selfishness. They're literally embedded in our genes. And why? Because selfishness has evolutionary advantages that allow us to survive and reproduce. Looking at our hunter-gatherer again, we can easily see why having this trait would be key. The problem? Pinker overlooks a key point. It isn't individuals who survive and reproduce. It's genes that do. And what does this mean exactly? Well, in the next book on our list, The Selfish Gene by the scientist Richard Dawkins, Dawkins emphasizes that altruism, or caring about the well-being of others, has huge evolutionary advantages too. And that for species to survive, selfishness and altruism must actually be genetically balanced within a population. Think about it. Humans have suffered through countless environmental and climate disasters, and there even used to be many other species of humans alive before and at the same time as humans. So where are they now? Well, as Bregman argues once again in his book Humankind, one of the key reasons we seem to have survived these catastrophes as opposed to, say, Neanderthals, is because humans are uniquely great at forming relationships of trust and cooperation. And this cooperation creates a powerful force that allows us humans to more quickly adapt to change. But does this evidence from our evolutionary past ultimately answer the question of whether humans are inherently good or evil? Well. It's one piece of the puzzle. We'll have to explore some other ideas first to get a clearer understanding of the big picture behind human motivation. To do so, let's take a look at the next book on our list, The Better Angels of Our Nature, again by Steven Pinker, as well as research in a field known as game theory, which studies how people make decisions in competitive situations. 
In this book, Pinker seems to suggest a key factor that determines whether we act violently or peacefully, and that factor is trust. In this book, Pinker exhaustively analyzes various periods in history and the types and levels of violence that have existed throughout time. As he claims, although we see high levels of violence today, the reality is that violence is far less common and widespread than it used to be. And although he doesn't discuss the fields of game theory and decision theory at length in his book, there is a highly relevant model in game theory that can help us understand how trust works, why it may lead to a decrease in violence, and importantly, whether humans are inherently good or evil. In game theory, researchers have run both experiments and computer simulations of the following scenario. Imagine a situation in which you are one of two participants. You can either choose to help or harm the other participant, but you both secretly suspect that you could benefit even more personally from harming each other. And you might be right, but since you're a nice person, you choose to help instead. But then what happens? You end up looking like a naive fool because the other participant chooses to take advantage of your niceness and harm you instead. So what do you do? Well, you harm them right back. And we can see how this situation now turns into a chain reaction of both people harming each other back and forth repeatedly, even if the end result is that they each lose more than they gain. For real life examples, think about how wars start, how political parties become polarized, and so on. It all comes down to the fact that the two participants lost trust with each other. In game theory, this is called the tit-for-tat scenario, and it has been used to explain everything from Cold War nuclear stockpile buildups to the creation of toxic workplaces. Can you think of a situation in your own life where a chain reaction of harm was caused by a breakdown of trust? Well, this has got to prove that we're wired for evil, right? Not so fast. Because over time, researchers have identified a modified version of this game, and the results might just surprise you. Let's run this scenario again. Once again, you start off by choosing to help the other participant, and once again, the other participant chooses to harm you. However, this time, instead of harming them back, you give them one more chance. Your response this time is once again to help them. Game theorists call this the generous tit-for-tat game, and years of research on generous tit-for-tat have demonstrated success in human interactions. We could see this in President Kennedy's response to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the subsequent decades of nuclear disarmament, in the healing of toxic workplaces, and many other scenarios. In fact, as Pinker aims to show in this book, the development of democracy itself created a sort of generous tit-for-tat game. In essence, democracy and the concept of rule of law created a system of trust that replaced the need for violence. Because violence, it seems, largely occurs when there are no clear rules whereby we can win and therefore no trust. The potential for good or evil in human behavior then seems less to do with some innate tendencies that we have and more to do with social and environmental factors which bring out these tendencies in us. And as we've seen, trust is one of those central factors. The greater the trust among a group of people, the better they tend to treat each other and work together. The less trust there is among a group of people, the worse they tend to treat each other, and the more they tend to actively work against each other. But if this is true, what kinds of situations build trust, and which ones destroy it? Well, that's where our next book on this list comes in. Hope for Cynics, The Surprising Science of Human Goodness by Stanford psychologist Jamil Zaki. In this book, Zaki explores decades of research on human motivation to demonstrate why cynicism, or the consistent mistrust of others and their motives, is not only irrational but also counterproductive to our interests. One powerful example he uses to demonstrate this point is the massive financial issues and corruption within the Boston Fire Department in the 90s. Along with legitimate corruption and waste, the firefighters themselves became targets of scrutiny. City officials simply assumed that the firefighters were abusing their vacation time and sick days because the number of time off requests due to injuries seemed excessive. In other words, the city officials started off with cynicism, assuming the worst of the firefighters. Have you ever had anyone, a boss, a manager, or someone else assume the worst of you? And how did you feel? Well, the firefighters felt the same way. They started to mistrust the city officials right back. And in fact, that's when many of them truly did start abusing their days off. And this all created a vicious cycle. And I mean, think about it. 
Research shows what should be common sense to us. When your boss monitors your screen time, what do you do? You buy one of those automatic mouse movers to pretend you're online when you're not. When you're a child in a classroom who is labeled as a troublemaker, you act out even more. In other words, people become who we believe them to be. People become what we expect of them. And so if we believe people are inherently evil, in a sense, they are. So now can you see why the generous tit-for-tat game we discussed earlier is so key? As we saw in the regular tit-for-tat game, mistrust became a never-ending feedback loop of escalating conflict. But simply by engaging in what Zaki calls loud trust, we can replicate the astounding effects of the generous tit-for-tat game. Telling and showing someone you trust them, even despite past transgressions on their part, sends a powerful message and empowers the other person to potentially change their behavior. In workplaces, this means giving workers more autonomy. In classrooms, this means assuming the best of students instead of the worst and digging deeper to understand why they're acting out. And on the world stage, it means being proactive as a leader and stepping up to say, I am the first one who will commit as we saw with actions such as those that led to the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which saved the ozone layer and the world, a feat of global cooperation which, at the time, was thought to be practically impossible. But if humans aren't inherently evil, and we have so much capacity for good, then how do we harness this capacity? And what can each of us do to have an impact on our greater society? Well, that's where our last two books come in, which I'll discuss together. Behave by Robert Sapolsky and Drive by Daniel Pink. In Sapolsky's book, he discusses at length the phenomenon of neuroplasticity and emphasizes what researchers have come to embrace more and more, namely that there is no inherent human nature and also no real distinction between nature and nurture. In other words, our brains are not fixed, they're changeable, just as our muscles can change, grow, or shrink in certain areas with targeted exercise. But what are those exercises we can engage our brain in to make ourselves and the world a better place? Well, going back to Zaki for a moment, I believe he has the best advice here especially when it comes to having conversations and interactions with people who disagree with each other. According to the research, good disagreeers do four things in conversation. One, they ask questions instead of making statements. Two, they work to get underneath people's opinions to their stories. Three, when they spot common ground, they name it. And four, when they are unsure about something, they say so, rather than pretending to be confident. Yet how many times have you seen political or other debates on TikTok or YouTube where the participants are using these methods? The answer, sadly, almost never. But that doesn't mean you can't. You and I can lead by example here. In Daniel Pink's book, Drive, he focuses on three cornerstones of human motivation, autonomy, purpose, and mastery. Underneath every statement we make, every idea we express, and every action we take, it is highly likely that our motivation to do so is reducible to one of these. The desire to have control over our lives, the desire to build our skills and create things, and the desire to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And so the truth is, we have far more in common with each other than we think we do, and the research bears this out. We are simply suffering from the illusion that we don't. And this illusion exists only because of a massive breakdown in communication. The only way to solve this? Be the first to step up. Something, someone, has to interrupt the chain reaction of that never-ending tit-for-tat game. And you can be that person. Hey guys, if you appreciated the information and analysis I've offered in this video and you want to be the kind of impactful person who does your part to change not only your life but also the world around you, then be sure to check out my dream life system at the link in the pinned comment below. In this course, you'll learn how to implement the science-based principles I've presented here and elsewhere to get out of that career you hate, start designing your ideal lifestyle, and start making an impact on those around you. Plus, you'll get some extra bonuses inside. In the meantime, if you want to keep leveling up your critical thinking to make a massive impact, not only on your own life, but on the lives of countless others, then be sure to watch this next video.